Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burrs. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today are Matthew Feeney, policy analyst with the Cato Institute, and Adam Bates, policy analyst at Cato's Project on Criminal Justice. Welcome to Free Thoughts, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, of course, in all areas of life, technology is changing pretty fast. And we, today we're going to be talking about how technology is changing law enforcement. And just as a an overview of the kind of stuff you guys are working on, what are we seeing – before we get down specifically into different technologies, what are we seeing immediately on the horizon of like big technological changes that, for law enforcement and police? Well, speaking for the kind of research that I've been working on, I think – that lots of changes in technology that we've witnessed in the civilian world are making their way to law enforcement. So this is not just miniature cameras, but it's also drones. Uh, technology that is used mostly by law enforcement that isn't quite as popular among people like you and me might be things like uh, facial recognition software uh, and things like that. And perhaps even further along in the horizon, we have things like uh, artificial intelligence and automated surveillance and things like that. And hoverboards. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to add on to what Matthew said, it's not just technology from the civilian world making its way into law enforcement. It's also technology from the military uh, that's increasingly finding its way into domestic law enforcement. Uh, things like uh, cell phone uh, trackers, cell phone surveillance devices, which uh, stingray devices, which is something I've done a lot of work on. Uh, uh, electronic card readers that can take money straight out of your uh, gift card accounts or your cash accounts at your bank. Uh, facial recognition technology, drones. I mean, the list just goes on and on. A anything that the government is using uh, overseas, any kind of technology, uh, is we're at a big risk of having that come home into domestic law enforcement. Is there something new going on here with this tech though? Because I mean, law enforcement has always used technology and always tried to embrace new technology to keep up with the criminal element and keep an eye on evildoers. Well, I think What's unique about the time we're in now is the threat to privacy is of particular acute concern. So while there are a lot of tools that are pushed forward by uh, accountability and transparency advocates like body cameras, uh, you run the risk of uh, these tools being used uh, in a very frightening way without the right rules uh, and procedures in place. Yeah, I think we, we have a problem with our jurisprudence and the, the framework uh, for how we oversee, for how we hold uh, law enforcement accountable, uh, our transparency rules, things like that are lagging far behind uh, the pace of the advancement in technology. And I think that's really where the problem is. Of course, technology will keep up with the times and it should uh, for law enforcement, but uh, that, that kind of legal regimes and our, our individual rights protections need to keep up also, and, and sadly they're not. So let's start with one of the ones you mentioned because we can just kind of go through some of these uh, b technology by technology. You mentioned stingrays, which uh, as, you t as you talked about, Adam, you've done a lot of work on these, but a lot of people don't know about stingrays. And, I, and, and when I've heard you lecture on this, you, you tell a story about a s trials and how stingrays were kind of discovered being used by the government, which I think is a good way of explaining, explaining what a stingray is and how terrifying it actually is. Right. So uh, there was a case in Florida about three years ago where uh, two young men decided they were going to rob. They were going to set up a, a drug deal and then they were going to rob uh, the drug dealer. So when the drug dealer got there, uh, they had BB guns that looked like real handguns. They robbed the drug dealer. They took the drugs. They took money. They took his cell phone. Uh, and then they fled. Uh, and a, a few weeks later, the police managed to, to track them down. And when the police caught them, they had the cell phone, they had the drugs, they had the money. Uh, so this is what we would call a, a slam dunk kind of case for, for the prosecution. Uh, yet when they went to court, uh, a wary defense attorney couldn't quite figure out how the police had managed to find uh, her client uh, and started asking the police, you know, how, how did you manage to track down our client just based on what uh, the victim told you? And that at that point, the police started invoking things like national security concerns to say they weren't at liberty to disclose uh, the nature of their investigation. That tends to be a good way to get a judge <laughs> to, to get a judge eye, judge's eyebrows raised, uh, and basically the police just refused to say where they uh, how they managed to track this person down. Uh, it, it ended up with uh, the prosecutor having to withdraw that evidence uh, because the police simply refused to 
uh, to explain themselves. And the the armed robbers ended up getting a very sweetheart plea deal uh, and going home that day rather than spending uh, 30 years in prison. Uh, so what a Stingray device actually is, is it's called a cell site simulator. Uh, so what it does is it mimics the signal of a cell phone tower and forces other cell phones in the area to connect to it. Once you're connected to it, the police can do things like track your location. Uh, they can get information off your phone. Uh, they can get its your international mobile subscriber identity, uh, your MC number, which identifies your phone as yours. Uh, it's widely accepted that these devices can even get content, such as uh, intercept the actual content of your phone calls, read your text messages, uh, although law enforcement has not been proven to be engaging in that behavior. Uh, but this is a serious surveillance device that has been used by the military and by the intelligence uh, agencies around the world. Uh, and it's being used now in domestic law enforcement, often without warrants, sometimes even without court orders. You said that this – it forces cell phones in the area to connect to it. So does this mean that the data it's getting is indiscriminate? Indiscriminate between the it, cell phones? In the sense or? that you can't pick out just like we want this person's cell phone, but instead you're going to suck down this data from all of the cell phones that you're forcing so to there, connect. So there are two ways that there are two ways that it can be used. One is if the police already have your MC number or they get it from your cell phone carrier, uh, they can just plug that number in and they can drive around. Uh, this thing's about the size of a, a suitcase uh, and they can ping – uh, for that individual number. And, and so that is how they location track. They can just drive around until they start getting hits on that individual number. Uh, the other way it's used is the way I mentioned, which is to just uh, force every cell phone within the range to connect to it. And at that point, uh, they typically will use visual surveillance. If they know who they're looking for, for instance, uh, they will follow that person around and as that person moves from place to place, the other numbers fall out until that's the only number left. And then they can – so they can derive your MC number. Uh, you can put those two tactics together uh, and then have a situation where the police do not know your MC number, but they can find it. And then they can track you after the fact. And also, obviously, uh, if they're at a, a political rally or a protest or uh, above Baltimore during the, the unrest, uh, they may just be interested in, in getting all that data at once. And these devices are capable of that. Yeah. So how is this different – so over the weekend, my we misplaced my wife's phone in a restaurant and I was able to find it by just doing the find my iPhone on mine and it tells us exactly where it is and I can erase it and I can emit a sound, which is how we found it in the hands of two teenage girls who are trying to make <laughs> off with it. Um, but is this is this scarier than that? Well, it's scarier in the sense that this is being used by the government and that this uh, – Insofar as uh, you're voluntarily uh, giving out the location of your uh, phone to Apple uh, in order in order to track it down, I think that's a much different scenario than having the government without people's knowledge, without any kind of uh, – in, in many cases, without any kind of judicial oversight, uh, gathering up this information and then attempting to introduce it against you uh, potentially in court. So, yeah, I think there's a much – there's a much graver threat uh, uh, in that scenario than, than the one you mentioned. So this is, this is basically like becoming – a cell tower for your like where your phone was no, normally connecting to the most proximate cell tower, it sucks them all into this thing. It's a mobile cell tower, and so suddenly the it's like the government's your cell phone provider in in a weird sense for for a bit. Right, uh, and your your phone is your phone is designed to connect without any input on your part is designed to connect to whatever tower is, is giving it the strongest signal at any time. Uh, the Stingray gives sends out a boosted signal that basically muscles out the legitimate cell phone signals and forces uh, the phones to connect to it. So this can all go on without your knowledge, uh, and you'll never know. Our phones could be on Stingrays right now. They could be yes. on Stingrays they right now. They have one hovering above Cato, and they, maybe they, they would. They, they might. They, uh, yes. That, but, that's but not that, impossible. That, of course, goes to the scary part because because you've alluded to it when you talked about the case, but the – the scarier part, I would say. <laughs> you alluded to it, but the the secrecy around these things is absolutely astounding. I mean, you can't. They don't. They don't acknowledge how it works. They don't even talk about. Like, there's only one person who builds it, but you're not even allowed to talk about. It. I mean, you you can get into it. It's amazing. Right. So yeah, even as someone who's generally cynical uh, about <laughs> government and technology and I things can like this, verify this. He is. <laughs> The, the the secrecy around this is is shocking. Uh, so uh, because so as I said, these started out in military hands in in the intelligence services. Uh, at, at some point, the Harris Corporation, which is the company that manufactures these devices, decided they wanted to start marketing them uh, to state and local law enforcement. 
uh, because they emit radio waves, they're regulated by the FCC. Uh, in the FCC's uh, licensing of, of stingrays uh, to, for use by state and local law enforcement, they, d- they came up with a rule that says if you are state or local law enforcement, you want a stingray, you have to coordinate that use with the FBI. Uh, so the FBI took its authority and they uh, constructed a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, it's a list of conditions that that uh, uh, police agencies have to agree to in order to use a stingray. Uh, and one of these conditions is you basically have to give the FBI veto authority over virtually every aspect of a stingray investigation. Uh, you're not to disclose that you have it. You're not to disclose how it works. Uh, if you produce evidence from it, you're not to disclose even to judges, even to defense attorneys in court where that evidence came from. Uh, And you have to give the FBI authority to uh, shut down prosecutions. You have to throw cases uh, if the FBI tells you to in order to protect the secrecy of this device. And that's what happened in that that case I mentioned, and it's happened in several places around the country. And that level of secrecy is, is just galling, I think. Why the concern with secrecy about it, though? I mean, if they work, they work. Or is this is there the possibility of eluding them if you know all of the details? So the the argument has been thus far that if uh, – in the name of terrorism and in the name of fighting the war on drugs, uh, if the bad guys uh, figure out how this technology works and they understand the capabilities of law enforcement, they'll be able to uh, elude it. I, I think that's, uh, that's not a very good – it's not a very persuasive argument. Uh, anybody who's watched The Wire uh, <laughs> knows that, that drug dealers and terrorists, they figured out their cell phones were liabilities a long time ago. Uh, so it, it's not an argument that rings very persuasive to me. But so far, the argument for the secrecy has been – it will, if everyone knows how these work, it will compromise uh, their efficacy. So what can we do? I mean, what, like what – is there anything we can – the successful legal challenges have been, have been brought or what can we do to try and protect ourselves? Because this, this, this seems to be something that they would love to use indiscriminately and get a lot of information on us and we would not even know. And they have been using them indiscriminately. I think a detective from Baltimore testified that they had deployed their stingray 4,300 times uh, in just a few years. Uh, so what can we do? Well, uh, this seems like a Fourth Amendment issue. Uh, so there have been court uh, challenges, and in the last few in the last few months, we've actually had some wins in places like Maryland, uh, arguing that they need a warrant. Uh, they need a warrant before they deploy the stingray. But one of the reasons it's been so difficult is because of this secrecy, because of like the non disclosure agreement. Whenever defense attorneys uh, started to get wind of what of what was going on here and started asking questions, they would just throw out the evidence or drop the case. Uh, the defendant takes his sweetheart plea deal or takes the drop case. Uh, so this never gets appealed up the chain. This this is never being seen by appellate judges who who would issue the kind of precedential rulings that where we would get a good case law on this. And so right now uh, we're at the very early stages of of legitimate case law on on stingray use. So moving on to uh, to other items items of technology, and since Adam brought up the Fourth Amendment, that is sort of an undercurrent of this entire. Where does the Fourth Amendment uh, apply in these new areas of peaking and coll- collecting data and things like this? Uh, now, Matthew, you've been you worked on body cameras, which has f- privacy and c- concerns. Um, these are body cameras for police. So can you just talk a little about what these are and, and how they work? A lot of people don't understand how they work and, and what the benefits and costs are to them. Yeah. So body cameras are, as the name implies, cameras that you attach to your body. And uh, officers can attach them to either their chest area or helmets, lapels. Uh, they, if they're wearing uh, other gear, they can attach it to pockets or belts and things like that. And the argument for them uh, is that they increase accountability and transparency in law enforcement. They're comparatively very easy to use. Uh, they operate with single button usage. Uh, the, one of the more popular models, the one made by Taser, records on 30 second loops. So the camera will record 30 seconds and delete, record 30 seconds, delete. When you activate the camera, the previous 30 seconds is saved and then uh, a larger file can be created. And the argument is that if uh, more and more officers wear them, that there will be reduced incentive for them to use excessive force. And it also means that it will be easier for investigators to investigate allegations of police misconduct. But they can also be used uh, by police to dispel frivolous accusations of sexual assault or misconduct. 
And unsurprisingly, these things are very, very popular. They are supported overwhelmingly by the vast majority of Americans, regardless of racial or political demographic. And there is some evidence to suggest that after being introduced, body cameras uh, do prompt some kind of reduction in use of force and complaints against the police. Although this is a you know, classic social science problem of correlation and causation. And in fact, there was a recent study that came out looking globally that found that actually body cameras were followed by an increase in assaults against police and excessive use of force. But I think actually that... It shouldn't, that shouldn't be the first priority on what the effect of these things are. I think their main value is in investigations, that as Americans, we deserve to know uh, after a controversial incident what actually happened, and body cameras undoubtedly help us in that endeavor. So if they're one button operated, record 30 seconds, delete it, does that mean that they depend on the officer deciding to turn them on? Yes, uh, and, and this has been a main point of contention, especially among police unions and other uh, police advocates, which is that they that these body cameras do introduce uh, an extra burden to the job. And this, this I think, um, is an argument that has some weight to it, but not enough that we should dismiss cameras altogether. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to actually hold one of these cameras. Uh, undoubtedly, there is a training period and people might make mistakes, but police have adapted to changes in technology in the past. Uh, dash cameras, uh, tasers, all these things come with training. And in fact, I think... You can uh, perhaps provide incentives for them to have good training and to really know what they're doing by mandating strict uh, punishment for officers that after training do forget to turn these things on when they should be on. But it is uh, definitely a point that has been widely debated. So the idea be that they – when they get out of their car after stopping someone, they turn it on or when they stop someone on the street, they turn it on. Yes, yeah. Uh, th there have been proposals written. I think the ACLU has proposed that if an officer should have had the camera on, but it happens to have been off, then the evidentiary burden switches. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what I what I think about that, but it is um, evidence that people are thinking hard about this. But the, the, you get into awkward questions because, of course, officers regularly talk to informants or undercover officers. They talk to children who have been sexually assaulted. They're talking to domestic abuse victims, uh, and it's, it's it's not, you know, you can understand why police would want there to be clear policy about, you know, well, can I record this if it's that kind of sensitive data? And then the question that's uh, also important is, well, should the public have access to that footage? Uh, and even things that aren't crimes, things like uh, car accidents, which officers regularly are at the scene of uh, gruesome accidents. And you can see why we might be concerned about there just being a, a industry of people requesting body camera footage to make gruesome YouTube videos, for example, of gore, basically. What sort of policies are we seeing in place to deal with, I mean, around the country? I, I imagine different police departments are doing different, yeah, having different yeah. policies about turning them on and how they store the footage and how they distribute the footage. Now, generally, also, are police unions against body cameras or, have, or do they think that it will help police out? Too. I think you're seeing uh, a shift, actually, that the officers are coming to understand that these are tools that can help them. And I've seen incidents of a uh, police officer being accused of sexual assault when he had done nothing of the kind, and it was easily disposed of as a frivolous complaint because the officer was wearing a body camera. And so I think you, you will gradually see shifts. Uh, now, there are 18,000 roughly law enforcement agencies in this country, the 50 states. Uh, the regulations governing these things um, is rather diverse. So, for example, in South Carolina, body camera footage cannot be requested via FOIA by journalists, just period. Uh, but then Washington, D.C. has comparatively quite good uh, policy on body cameras. Uh, Baltimore, for example, has a policy that bans facial recognition software. Uh, and, and the storage of this is, is in large part uh, a, a fiscal issue because the, these are collecting massive amounts of data uh, and storing all that data can be expensive, not to mention the redacting of the footage if it's going to be released. And so in large part, I think uh, fiscal reality will dictate policy. Uh, it's, it's unreasonable to, to impose, for example, on, on a police department with a small budget that they must keep all body camera footage for 10 years, for example. Uh, that's not an actual policy, but hypothetically. Um, yeah, sorry. Aaron, this seems like one of those areas where it would be hard for the regulations to keep up with the tech, 
because the things that we're concerned about, like how easy these things are to use or how much onboard storage they have or mm -hmm. whether you can store 10 years worth of footage, I mean, the answers to those questions and the costs of answering yes to all those decline so quickly compared to compared to whether we can update the regulations that I just see the regulations becoming way out of date really fast. Yes. Uh, so you, you raised the, an interesting and, and important point, which is that the cost of these things will decrease as technology improves, uh, which is a good thing. And uh, we will probably be able to store more data for longer uh, and it will be higher quality. And uh, the redaction of that will be a lot easier. And so I think – and there's also the other fiscal point, which is that actually if it is true that body cameras reduce complaints against the police and the number of use of force incidents, there'll be less resources uh, and money spent on paperwork and investigations and all these other kinds of things. What are the – and right now what are we seeing is like the, in your opinion the best – policies and practices related to body cameras in the sense of do you think FOIA requests should be generally allowed or – Yeah. So uh, shameless plug, I did write a Cato paper advocating the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the ideal you – know, what I consider to be the best practices for body cameras. So I think ideally that the incidents that the public are concerned with uh, – so these are arrests, detentions, use of force. These kind of incidents I think – should, if caught on body camera, be made available to the public. Although I do make an exception for body camera footage filmed in an area where you have a expectation of privacy. So I don't think, for example, if a SWAT team busts into my home and they're wearing body cameras, that Adam should be able to request that footage. My living room reveals, uh, you know, it could reveal my political beliefs, my uh, religious beliefs, perhaps my sexual orientation. Uh, but I think that I, and my attorney, at the very least, should be able to have access to that footage. And so I think that balances the desire for increased accountability and transparency with privacy. And we're just generally probably going to get used to this in the sense of it'll be an expectation. I think as these get more and more used, it'll just be an expectation that the cops are filming you right now and people are being filmed by cops. And Yeah, and, and it, there are also concerns about people who are not the target, for example, or the subject. Uh, so it's not hard to imagine a situation where a, a fight breaks out at a restaurant, for example, or a bar and police are called. Now, you don't have a very strong expectation of privacy in a bar. So police arrive and they arrest the guy who started the fight. But the body camera footage, which is released to the public, shows a well-known businessman uh, treating a woman who is not his wife to a drink. And he was not involved in the bar brawl at all. And yet uh, the body camera footage is showing to anyone on YouTube who's interested that he was uh, behaving uh, in an inappropriate manner. But uh, I think that there is uh, an interesting point to be made about how this technology will change how we even think about our expectations of privacy and what we can expect to be really private. How is that situation different from what we're long used to, which is the cops can take photographs or they can interview people at the scene or require people to testify in court or the evidence from all of those methods of gathering gets released um, so this is just, I mean, is this is this fundamentally different from the other, you know, we happen to see you at the bar and so now it's known or we happen to take pictures and now it's known? Yeah, so there's no fundamental difference. Uh, without body cameras, uh, Officer Smith would say, I came to the bar and I uh, arrested John Doe after a complaint from blah, blah. And the, the, the only difference here is, of course, um, even if the officer is taking uh, photos of the the suspect. That body cameras are just capturing way more data than we've been used to. Before we move on to to drones, uh, uh, I think you were talking about privacy, and then with Adam, we're talking about stingrays, which is also, of course, privacy. And the Fourth Amendment has has been alluded to, but so maybe we can take a little bit of a, a little segue to talk about the Fourth Amendment as it relates to these kind of privacy issues themselves. Because the, the the body cameras, of course, were accountability and things like this, but the stingrays are getting into places that are pr private or, or we, most of us think that they're private. How, how does the Fourth Amendment even historically have dealt with these kind of technologies that could invade the privacy of individuals? Well, I, I would say that uh, our jurisprudence over the past 50 years or so uh, has has taken uh, our conception of privacy as a jurisprudential matter and, and kind of got off track and, and left us in a very poor uh, position to argue constitutionally 
uh, for uh, the kinds of policies that will protect our privacy from this this kind of technology. Uh, so uh, people may be familiar, we, they have heard it discussed here, this reasonable expectation of privacy uh, is one of the standards that the Supreme Court uses. Uh, that if if you're uh, expressing yourself in a way where or just behaving in a, in a location where you do not have what is considered a reasonable expectation of privacy in your behavior, um, it is not a Fourth Amendment search even uh, for the government. What does that mean when you say it's not a Fourth Amendment search? It doesn't uh, implicate your constitutional rights. Uh, so the police are allowed to do this without getting a warrant, without establishing probable cause. Uh, uh, a corollary of that is what's known as the third party doctrine, which is very relevant to things like the Stingray device, uh, which is any information that you voluntarily convey to a third party, you are essentially relinquishing your uh, expectation of privacy in that information. Uh, when these rulings were handed down in the 60s and 70s, that wasn't such a big problem. Uh, but now that almost everyone has a device in their pocket that is constantly uh, beaming information to third parties, namely their, their cell phone carrier, uh, this information is just floating around uh, and uh, police departments that have been asked to justify their use of, of Stingray devices have cited the third party doctrine to say, look, uh, you are uh, voluntarily conveying the data that your cell phone sends out uh, and therefore we don't need a warrant uh, to get it. That seems messed up when it comes to Stingrays because like it's like the government has made themselves the third party. <laughs> but I mean in a weird way, they've become the cell phone tower. They like, put themselves in the middle. In they the middle make, of right. it, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Does this just mean though that we need to revise down our expectations of privacy? I mean the world is constantly changing. Technology is constantly changing. We all are doing things voluntarily with our data that would have been unimaginable decades or centuries ago. And so what's wrong with just saying, look, you know, we, we've got this tech. It's not – it's out there. You know it's out there. I mean you said stingrays are being kept secret but you were able to describe them in mm. relative detail. Um, this is just a changing world and it may it may take some time for our expectations to catch up, but there's nothing wrong with that. If you think uh, that uh, the reasonable expectation of privacy and the third party doctrine are the proper analytical framework for understanding what our rights are, uh, then yeah, I think that I think that's correct. as we as the government does more of this, as more of our lives are, are open to uh, public scrutiny and voluntarily conveyed uh, to, to the internet <laughs> uh, to the series of tubes, uh, yeah, I think I think our expectation of privacy has diminished and will con continue to diminish. I don't think that answers necessarily the the privacy interest question or the constitutional question. Uh, maybe we should be asking whether uh, a reasonable expectation of privacy is the proper question to ask when we're uh, discussing whether the government should have access to this information or be able to use it against you in court. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, Justice Sotomayor in her uh, Jones concurrence wrote, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but she did write um, on, on this point saying, you know, I would ask, do people reasonably expect that all this data can be, is, is being gathered and used? Uh, and, and what you can find out uh, about people is astonishing. It's far more revealing uh, than I think a lot of people Realize. I mean, we, we sitting here at Cato know about these tools and know uh, that this is how cell phones work and everything. But I don't know if most Americans actually do think that my shopping habits or whether I'm cheating on my wife or not or what kind of food I like, you know, if all of that is actually willingly exposed to the government and that they should be able to analyze it at whim. But it's, is it – I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask the cliched question, but I, I think it's a cliche for the reason – is it uh, that big of concern for people who are not criminals? I, mean, I think most people, most people, don't deal with the cops generally in their lives. They don't they don't run in run into them that much. I mean, they, except for traffic violations, they don't have a record. Right? They've never spent time in jail, and so they don't have that much to worry about. And so, so we're trying to protect all these privacy rights, but ultimately speaking. If you're not even getting getting into the police ambit, uh, meaning you're not having them raiding your house or things like this, then they're not going to be seeing stuff. So, I mean, I'm not terribly concerned. I'm not really in the police ambit, and I'm not terribly concerned right now about stingrays above my house, or I'm not terribly concerned about them finding things out. So, I mean, this is the if you're not doing anything wrong, then why do you care? But like, is it more important to catch criminals than to than to protect this kind of privacy that that maybe people don't value as much as we think they do? 
Well, you might not um, be doing thing, anything on the government's radar now, but you could be. Uh, I think uh, at the moment, our law enforcement and certainly our intelligence agencies are, are very heavily focused on Islamic terrorism. And um, because I'm, I'm not a Muslim, I also, like Trevor, don't really spend uh, much time thinking, am I under surveillance or anything like that? But I don't know, a president in 16 years who avowedly hates libertarians and is not a fan of, um, a fan of us and thinks that we are a threat to national security... Uh, then I would begin to worry. Uh, it's true, you have nothing to, to fear unless you're doing anything wrong, but what the government considers wrong can change uh, quickly and dramatically. I've spent years trying to get under government surveillance, so I, I'm even coming at it from a, a different perspective. But I, I think I think you're right that I think the average person on the street thinks that. Uh, I'm not doing anything wrong. Uh, I run into this all the time, uh, and I think people who work in criminal justice, especially about police searches and things like that, run into that attitude all the time. Uh, but it's always wrong. Uh, People don't know uh, what the law is. People don't know whether they're doing something uh, the government frowns upon. Uh, and I will uh, pull the Glenn Greenwald trick, which is to ask anyone who doesn't really think uh, they have anything to hide, uh, just send me their email accounts and passwords. And I give you my word. I will not do anything with your account. I'll just look through your email for a while. Uh, I think people, if you drill down a little bit, people do care more about their privacy than the, than I think they let on uh, just at that high level, I'm not doing anything wrong uh, attitude. Well, but I mean, so I wouldn't want to give you my search history, but police officers are the good guys, the good guys. agents of the state, the same way that like I tell my doctor things that I wouldn't want to make public, but that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with my doctor possessing that knowledge. Well, I think the the history of government surveillance should should give you pause on this. Uh, that you know, the the instinct is to think that law enforcement is uh, is here to protect us, and they are the good guys. And to a large extent, that is that is true. But uh, the last uh, hundred years or so have um, provided countless pieces of evidence to the contrary. Listeners should check out our colleague uh, Patrick Eddington's timeline of government surveillance in this country. Uh, everyone from feminists, socialists, the ACLU, civil rights leaders, the number of people that have been put under surveillance in this country is by no means limited to Islamic terrorists. Well, I think it's kind of terrifying too, as Adam, as Adam said, that you probably have committed quite a number of felonies without knowing mm -hmm. it. And so that being the case, if, you, if your life is an open book to the police and to prosecutors, the only thing that's actually protecting you is that they just don't really want to take the time to prosecute. But if they decided they wanted to, pretty much everything could be there for them to do that successfully, which is a pretty you know, weak read upon which to rest freedom. Um, but I wanted to get back into the, the question, could the technology, we get, to, we get into drones. Uh, but, but before we get into drones or like as we get into drones, the question of how these new technologies challenge old Fourth Amendment doctrine. You, you mm. brought up the third party thing, but there's also when it comes to drones, these technologies are moving a little bit faster than the Fourth Amendment doctrine. But the point of the reasonable expectation of privacy element of Fourth Amendment is so it actually – because the reasonable expectation of privacy changes with the times. So it tries to adjust the Fourth Amendment to different technologies that are going on. So maybe it works just fine for that. Yeah, I, uh, I think I could discuss a few uh, cases that show that not to be the case. Uh, and while it is the case that the Supreme Court uh, does catch up with technology, it's always playing catch up uh, and technology always moves faster. And sometimes when it does eventually catch up, the finding its rulings are sometimes unsatisfactory. And this like this brings me back to the expectation of privacy test, which I think is most important when we're talking about drones, which can be used for police surveillance. Because the closest analogy we have to drones is is airplanes, really, when it comes to the kind of tools that police might use to look for people. Airplanes, right, helicopters, airplanes. airplanes. And to bring this back to the reasonable expectation of privacy test, there's, there's a, a, a case that's very relevant to this called um, California versus Sorallo, which was in the 80s. And uh, police officers received an anonymous tip that Dante Sorallo was growing marijuana in his backyard. And... Dante Sorallo actually had a six foot and 10 foot fence around his property. So his backyard couldn't be observed from the public sidewalk. So the police without a warrant took to the air in an airplane at a thousand feet, spotted marijuana in Sorallo's backyard and got an arrest. 
Ensoralo sued, saying that this was a violation of his uh, Fourth Amendment rights, and the Supreme Court ruled that actually, no, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy to the contents of your backyard, even if you have a 10-foot fence around your backyard. And then a few years later, in another case called Florida v. Riley, which is very similar, police, again, looking for marijuana, uh, took to a helicopter at 400 feet and uh, observed marijuana in Riley's uh, greenhouse. And I like the, the Florida v. Riley case in particular because it includes uh, a dissent from Justice Brennan that includes an amazing, I think, piece of uh, prescience. And it's worth keeping in mind that this was written in 1989 because in Riley, the plurality said this was not a Fourth Amendment violation. But Brennan wrote, imagine a helicopter capable of hovering just above an enclosed courtyard or patio without generating any noise, wind, or dust at all, and for good measure without posing any threat of injury. Suppose the police employed this miraculous tool to discover not only what crops people were growing in their greenhouses, but also what books they were reading, who their dinner guests were. Suppose, finally, that the FAA regulations remained unchanged so that the police were undeniably where they had a right to be. Would today's plurality continue to assert that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures was not infringed by such surveillance? And these miraculous tools that Brennan is talking about are now available not just to law enforcement, but to us for only a couple hundred dollars. And drones are much cheaper than helicopters and airplanes, and they're much easier to use. Uh, and it won't be a surprise to any of us that police continue to use them in the future. But Riley and Serralo do offer rather unsatisfying precedents at this time. But isn't this, again, just expectation? I mean, so drones get to be everywhere and so what that means is just blinds and yeah just up put your backyard. A, yeah yeah i mean you know grow it somewhere that can't be seen yeah so uh well we might um say that riley riley and Sorallo were not wise marijuana growers and maybe they should have uh, done it inside but i think what 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 i i have spoken to adam about this before off mic that, that there's something very troublesome and perhaps wrong about this reasonable expectation of privacy test because as technology improves, the expectation of privacy seems to diminish. And the problem here uh, fundamentally is that if, if the Fourth Amendment is supposed to protect, uh, I mean, as it's, it's actually you know, mostly a property amendment, but if we're supposed to find the privacy right somewhere in the shelter of the Fourth Amendment, it seems to just use, lose a lot of what it's supposed to be for, which is to protect this thing that we call privacy. This is a little bit off topic, but one of the things that's struck me and, and is a recurring theme, so when you are doing, say, taking a course on Fourth Amendment uh, in law school and you're reading all of these cases, there's, there's a lot of laws on the books and a lot of ways to break the law, but the common theme in basically every case that seems to diminish our Fourth Amendment protection is drugs. So all the ones that we've mentioned today, I think, have been drug-related. And so what – is there something special about drugs that causes it to cause these rollbacks or to be the common theme in all of these cases? So I, I would suggest there is a giant smoking crater in our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence where the drug war landed and uh, the war on terror is not far behind as far as the effects. Uh, but I think uh, there was a determination uh, among uh, judges that – uh, because of the way the drug market, because of the nature of drugs, of contraband, how easy they are to dispose of, how, how easy it is to engage in this illegal behavior outside the purview of law enforcement and the privacy of your own home, uh, it would be very difficult to prosecute the war on drugs uh, if police could not look inside your home, could not look inside your backyard. And I do think that or even even like your bodily orifices or, yeah, or, or, like, or your, yes. your body cavities. <laughs> so I do think at some point there may perhaps subconsciously there was a decision made that uh, the administrative ease of fighting the drug war uh, and preventing the destruction of evidence, uh, which is how we get to things like no knock warrants and SWAT raids. Uh, that that prosecuting the drug war was more important than than uh, maintaining a rigorous protection of of our Fourth Amendment values. So yes, I think that the drug war absolutely uh, has has twisted uh, our jurisprudence in, in a very uh, nasty way for for privacy rights. I I agree, uh, but I want to offer some 
uh, some hope uh, in this conversation because while I think the conversation so far has really highlighted some of the problems with the expectation of privacy tests, uh, there's nothing stopping states from going above and beyond the floor set by the Supreme Court. And actually, uh, Florida law explicitly defines expectation of privacy to uh, take into account aerial surveillance and says you have an expectation of privacy uh, in the contents of your property that are observable from ground level, basically. Uh, and there's, uh, I think, a bill in New Hampshire that does something similar. And uh, while I was doing work on drones, Adam reminded me that Justice Alito in uh, a case actually says, explicitly says, you know, you don't rely on the blunt instrument of the Fourth Amendment to fix this technology meets privacy problem. Uh, legislatures can deal with this. The, the drug war point is interesting because it is, I mean, as we imagine the future here, and there's a couple of things that are even more terrifying and th things I'm sure we can't even imagine right now. But these drones can be the size of a little bug. I mean, they can they can be silent. I mean, they like so you could probably, I guess, under current jurisprudence, flying it into a house would probably violate basic questions. But flying it around your windows and things like that, I mean, it gets it gets kind of terrifying. But the interesting question is, is if there if you weren't fighting a drug war. What would you possibly be using such a drone for? I mean, like there, you could imagine only a few pretty highly dangerous situations that then the drone would be used for to find like weapons and things like this. And so, yes, without the drug war, you you can imagine cops would be like, well, we have this drone, but we don't even really know what to do with it. We, we look for you know stolen goods and guns, and that's about it. But not the contraband of, of drugs. What kind of what kind of drone technology is out there? What kind of stuff is coming up? And what other kind of concerns are, are play, even aside from? Because you talked about facial recognition and drones and things like this. Uh, um, we've talked off mic about this. So what? what I mean, it seems that this could get pretty scary pretty quickly. Yeah, well, some of the stuff that already exists is rather frightening. So you've just mentioned very small drones, and those do exist. And, and I've seen footage from, from labs of a couple dozen drones being programmed to fly through windows by themselves. And you know all these things with uh, surveillance devices are rather frightening to comprehend. Uh, though we also are finding uh, that the military, as Adam spoke uh, earlier about, the military has developed technology that could perhaps in the future be used for domestic law enforcement. There is a piece of equipment called Argus, uh, which is named after the, the mythical uh, Greek 100-eyed god, which uh, is capable of putting a medium-sized city basically under constant surveillance uh, from and from a height of tens of thousands of feet can zoom in to you know, less than a foot of detail. Uh, it automatically tracks moving objects. And you can, uh, I suppose, with expectation of privacy jurisprudence, anyone who's outside can't, you know, reasonably expect that what they're doing is uh, is private. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, that kind of surveillance being used by domestic law enforcement, but uh, you, it's very easy for listeners to find uh, footage of an engineer showing off this uh, piece of technology using uh, Quantico Virginia as the example. Point, pointing, so it's certainly been used at least, uh, at least once. And I think that kind of technology is only going to improve, that you will have uh, Areas um, the size of cities that can be surveilled in very high detail with only one piece of equipment. And miniature drones uh, pose a whole, I mean, depending on how small they can get, but it's, it's uh, not inconceivable that in, you know, in not the too distant future, maybe 10 years, 20 years, that you'll have drones the size of insects that will be able to fly around with a whole range of surveillance equipment. So we've spoken briefly about facial recognition software, uh, and I like talking to... Uh, lawyers here at Cato about that, because this question of whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy to the details of your face is a rather uh, interesting question. But there's also vein recognition, uh, gait recognition, uh, all these uh, kind of surveillance gait, tools. You mean how, you, how you walk? How you walk. Uh, so everyone has a unique gait. Uh, so if you have uh, the gait data of someone, you could potentially, I suppose, program that to, into a camera that is looking out for someone with that unique gait. How much can we so one of the heartening things that we've seen in response to specifically the Snowden disclosures um, is the technology industry fighting back and doing what it can to close the opportunities for the government to surveil. So making encryption standard and locking things down more. Um, how much can 
we, I guess, fight an arms race with the government on a lot of this stuff simply through improving tech, like these stingrays. Could those be defeated by Apple releasing the next iPhone with a different cell technology that is not susceptible to them? So uh, my understanding is if, if, they, if they're using the current uh, cell phone, cell network infrastructure, uh, that they're susceptible to these devices. I, I don't know enough about the tech to tell you whether it would be possible uh, to, to design around it. I, I think one of the problems there, though, is – and it's kind of the irony of this whole idea, especially about the secrecy, is in a situation like that, the people who take those measures to protect themselves are the people like us, you, you know, the civil libertarians, uh, the criminals who have a vested interest in, in frustrating this surveillance, uh, but the people who the people who don't or don't care or don't know how or don't feel like making the effort, those are the people who are most at risk. Those are the people who are innocent. Uh, and so those are the people who still, even if there is this kind of tech arms race to frustrate uh, the, the surveillance state, uh, the people who are most at risk and most likely to be harmed aren't likely to, to really benefit uh, from that. Uh, I think so. When it comes to things like uh, using uh, uh, browser anonymizers, uh, like the Tor network or things, this is not something that the average person in America does. Uh, despite the fact it's relatively easy to do, it's just not uh, like what Trevor mentioned earlier about most people don't think they have anything to worry about and they don't fully understand the implications of what's going on. So even if there were these measures that we could use, it's not clear that that the average American would would be interested in using them. One of the responses to especially us libertarians when we are griping about the government's data collection um, and privacy invasions in all of these ways is the why aren't you concerned with corporate America um, comeback? You know, so we we say like it's not okay. If we don't want all of this footage being gathered up by police departments because there's huge privacy concerns there and we we don't want them sucking down all the information about our cell phones or being able to easily locate us but we don't see oh, live stream my life yeah, yeah. We, yeah. yeah we don't have any yeah. problem with facebook which is gathering extraordinary amounts of highly identifiable data on us and so on the one hand should we be concerned about that kind of data collection too which is becoming more pervasive um, and if we are, should we – as we push for greater Fourth Amendment protections, um, should we also be pushing for greater protections, regulations of our privacy data for private entities? Well, so I think you, you, you raise an, an interesting concern because uh, while we've spoken about drones in the law enforcement context, it's not – inconceivable that there will one day be delivery drones and what if Amazon drones have all this kind of stuff on it? Uh, maybe they will have cameras, maybe they won't. Uh, or Google Earth. Or Google, right. But uh, I think whenever people say this, my, my first uh, – th the first thought that occurs to me is, but, you know, Facebook can't arrest me. Uh, and the stuff I disclose uh, is – is for a large part voluntary. Uh, although privacy advocates will talk about, you know, logging out of Facebook and uh, Twitter and all these other things as often as um, you can. Uh, and I think you might see a shift in what people consider private uh, without uh, there being too much worry. So people put up too many photos of their vacation and it's widely available to everyone. Uh, the people like me, I'm rather selective when it comes to Facebook. Uh, then you got Adam here who puts everything on Facebook to, <laughs> to the public. Uh, but uh, I, ultimately though, I think the, the intention is, is – is different. I, I'm reminded of that story about uh, a father getting furious at Target because his 16-year-old teenage daughter had been sent ad advertisements for pregnancy tests or young young mother products, and it turns out that Target had figured out that you know she was probably pregnant based on buying patterns. Uh, that stuff is all you know. It might strike people as spooky, but I think ultimately Target and Facebook are n not as threatening as uh, law enforcement. And to, to bolster that point, uh, I, I'll use the doctor example that, that you used earlier, Aaron. Uh, I share information with my doctor, but there's an understanding and a trust that my doctor is trying to help me with that information. Uh, and we can go back and forth, I suppose, uh, about whether things like uh, marketing algorithms and those and the collection of data from uh, 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 commercial interest is meant to help us or help us get things we want. Uh, but it's very clear historically uh, that when the government is looking through your emails or it's looking through your mail or it's listening to your phone calls, it is never 
for your benefit. They're, it's they're protect never us from terrorism. Well, it's not not when they're listening to my phone calls. They're not protecting well, me from terrorism. If they knew that beforehand, if they knew <laughs> right. that you weren't a terrorist, but, then that would be easy. But yes. so the, these these effort to to uh, agree with Matthew about the intent, the effort of the government to surveil everything I do and say and and communicate to people is to me a fundamentally antagonistic. Uh, uh, interaction and 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 I agree with Matthew. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have an army. Uh, he doesn't have prisons. He can throw me in. Uh, the data that he's collecting is not going to be used against me uh, to to put me away or to infringe on my liberty. What about the the third party doctrine that you mentioned? Is it a significant concern that Facebook has all this data if the government can just ask for it? Right. So, it, so if you if you put that information out there publicly, then yes, then that's where the third party doctrine comes in to say, well, look, you uh, you put this out there. Even there, I do think there is a concern, and I th I think the doctrine could uh, use some tuning. Simple. We have, for instance, automated license plate readers. Uh, that can collect uh, and process thousands of license plates in a, in a very short time as the police car is driving down the street. People may have seen these mounted on the trunks of police cars facing diagonally out. Uh, but so everyone would agree that your license plate, uh, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your license plate. That's the whole point of it. Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, a, a cop standing on the street could not possibly process that information or really do anything with it. Meanwhile, if they take these to a political rally, uh, or a church or a mosque, uh, and they scan the license plate of everyone there, and they uh, record it, and they retain this data, uh, that seems like it's a fundamentally different situation, uh, despite the fact that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So I think the mass aggregation of data, uh, even publicly uh, released data, is still something we should be concerned about and, and guard against. When these technologies and, and other ones, like I said, we can't even name micro drones, face recognition, you know, nano drones, whatever. Uh, should we expect them on some level to be abused? Uh, well, there's been law enforcement abuse of most other technologies, so I don't see uh, why there necessarily would be an exception. Uh, sure. But the, this is why, you know, at think tanks like this, we propose policies and procedures that should be in place. I think absent... It, a, absent regulation, uh, tools like body cameras uh, are a tool for totalitarianism, right, and, and are quite frightening. But with the right policies in place, they are a great tool for increasing accountability in law enforcement and figuring out what's really going on. It's great for researchers and activists and things like that. But uh, you know, it's it's silly to talk about technology as, I guess, m morally neutral. Uh, but these devices are made good or bad by the rules that govern them, not the technology intrinsic in and of itself. Uh, and yeah, and it would probably be naive uh, to think that we're going to stack up all the stingrays and throw them in the ocean. I mean, that that's not realistic. That's uh, of course, uh, law enforcement technology is going to advance, uh, but there's a, a great difference uh, between. Uh, advanced technology that where there is accountability, where there's transparency, where everybody knows what's going on and what you're capable of, uh, and uh, law enforcement technology that's being used in abject secrecy where they're uh, being dishonest with judges, with defense attorneys, with the public. Uh, we have separated powers. We have checks and balances, uh, not because police or the government are bad people, but because they're people. Uh, and we need these checks to hold people accountable. And where the police are frustrating these checks, uh, to do things in secret or outside the, the oversight of the public or, or legislatures, uh, that's a problem. And we should expect ab abuse because that's what happens in secret. I do uh, w want to, to briefly add, though, that the, there are reasons to be um, thankful that this technology is, is around. It's, it's, it's not hard at all to imagine that drones would be great with you know, a missing child in a national park or very good at coordinating firefighting efforts, potentially. Uh, or that stingrays might be useful to um, help find kidnapped children, if, if the child has a phone, obviously. Um, so while, while you know, here I, I'm sitting at Cato, I'm constantly worried about the potential abuses, I think the, the potential benefits should also not be ignored. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Mark McDaniel and Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.